My name's Nick, I'm a non-Orthodox Christian, and I'm an out and proud parent of my daughter Hazel, who's gay. There is no definitive moment, I'm afraid. It was just a gradual change, one of, of many changes that came up over, you know, over the journey. But I suppose looking back on it now, I think maybe just before lockdown, she was training two goalkeepers for a local club. And one of the names of these goalkeepers started to crop up in conversation. Emma continued to be mentioned quite a lot <laughs> uh, and eventually Hazel said to my wife first with instructions that she wasn't wanted to tell me that uh, she had strong feelings for Emma and she knew that Emma had strong feelings for her and after a while those that was conveyed to me and I think I, I was really surprised I wasn't surprised that it was a, a, a woman. So much a surprise that Hazel had actually found somebody and was actually looking because Hazel was the ultimate independent woman. And I think it was kind of a joyous thing really because I, I was more, much more interested in who is Hazel going to be with, having said all this time, oh, I'm not going to be with anybody. Then suddenly she's, she's suddenly saying, well, I, yeah, I've got this now. and. and she often used to sit on, on on this settee and my wife and I sat on the other settee and we watched Telly at night and she'd go, stop it, stop it, stop all those displays of affection. I go, I don't like it, I don't like it, I'm not comfortable with it, you know. And then suddenly she says, oh, Dad, I, I, I get it now. I get it what you've got with Mum now. I, I get it, you know, I understand it. And I think that, that, I, and that was great. I, I just love that. And I, I love the fact that she's got somebody. And I think in the back of my mind, I don't, I don't care who it is, as long as they're looking after her, right? I really, you know, but we are, in a way, I suppose, we're kind of the, the rebellious parents, so we're not going to care, you know, and it never occurred to me that anyone would, I suppose, not now. Gosh, how wrong I was, eh? <laughs> and was because people in the close family who had held Hazel on their knee as a child, said, oh, I love her, isn't she beautiful? Isn't she like, oh, you're so lucky. And then all the way through, they've been so loving and kind. And then suddenly, I don't want to know about that. I don't want to hear her mention. I don't want to hear about the girl who's taken our lovely Hazel away. You know, I don't. you don't mention her in here and I do not want you bringing her around here. We don't want anything to do with her. And we don't want to hear about your life. We don't want to know about it. Look at this. It is an abomination. Your relationship is an abomination. Really? You know, somebody's using the word abomination in the 21st century. You know, this is what? This is what you shouldn't be doing. It's quite clear in the Bible. Actually, it isn't clear in the Bible. So I'm afraid there's, you know, 31,000 verses in the Bible, seven verses dealing with same sex from a person who also thinks that women should have their head covered in church and slaves should be good to their masters. Yeah, do we really want to take his word for anything? I don't think so. You know, but you can't argue with people. You can't argue with fundamentalists because they're going to cherry pick what they want. Because if, you've, if you're a hateful person, you've got a hateful God. If you want a, a loving God, you have to be a loving person. So you can't get those people to change their viewpoint because their viewpoint's coming from, not coming from the Bible. It's cherry picked and then it's, you know, sorted out so that it fits their politics. I mean, you never get anybody challenged in a church to do anything against their politics. Never challenged to change their politics. Never challenged to change the way they feel about you know, LGBTQ people never challenge the way they feel about anything. They're all, all the verses are all support what they believe, you know. Well, 
this is what we got. And I, th I think on one stage from some of the people who've been on missions work with Hazel in Bulgaria, were sending her text. You're going to be damned. Do you not realize that? You're damned. You're in hell. You go, this is Satan confusing you. Don't read these Bible verses. It says you should love everybody. You're in hell. You're going to hell. Please don't die while you're in this relationship because you're just going to go straight there. And we're talking about 11, 12 texts on the trot within the space of 10 minutes or something, a complete diatribe. That was traumatic. For relatives that she'd known the whole of her life, that loved her unconditionally, but now rejected her and caused her pain and bullied her. I mean, it hurt us massively. It completely ripped up the family because now there are people not seeing who won't see each other. There are people who won't talk to each other. Um, you know, we had to go to my other daughter's child's um, christening and we were on opposite sides of the room, you know, and there was no need for it. There's no need for it. Microaggressions. I've got to tell you every week how much I hate what you're doing. You're living in that sin. That's very painful. I, and it's painful for us as parents, but I think it's a shock. And it took me a while to think this one out. But you think when you're growing up in your family, you assume unconditional love. But whatever you do, you can go back to your parental home and be accepted. Or go back to you know your family because they've always loved you and it's unconditional. And then you get this bile coming back. Oh, well, at least you'll be able to go on the marches now. Those marches that they have in London, won't you? Yeah, because everybody's like that, aren't they? Everybody gay goes on marches. Um, and it, it's, I mean, partly it's generational, partly it, it's religious. And I know, you know, some of these people first 50 years of their life probably it was illegal you know and it's hard to make that jump but i don't want to hear your issues i can't hear your issues because you know you've just broken down all the, the family and the community in which i live and which hazel lives and which was so certain and so secure that family was so secure and now it's just blasted to bits because Emma can't go around to see them because they don't want to see her. They won't go to an event where Emma is present and we won't go to an event that Emma is barred from. So in that case, we'll never meet at any social event. Those social events are finished. And, and at one stage, somebody said to us, even if you talk us round that it's not biblical and that it's okay biblically, um, we still don't like it. I thought, well, that's even worse because you haven't even got the Bible to fall back on. You're just saying, oh, I'm prejudiced. I mean, that's fine. You know, it isn't fine. I have to see people and respect their point of view. But sometimes I have these anger attacks and I'll be on my own. And I just suddenly realise I've gone from what to 60. And that, that can be quite difficult to deal with. I'm trying to deal with it. But I haven't quite got around it yet because the bond that you have with your daughter is just unbreakable. Whatever she wants to do is fine by me. And, you know, if she walks down the aisle, I'll be as proud as I was walking down the aisle with my other daughter. And, and maybe there'll be a bit more to it because I know that she's won again that she's triumphed again over people who have their own issues and are threatened by the fact that she's got it together. And I don't care if there's only three of us in the church where my wife will be there as well, but it, it, it has, you know, it, it changes things. And it changes things because of prejudice is something that you see on the telly and read about on the news. But when it hits you in the face, it, it just alerts you to the pain there is in the world. And it's needless, it's so needless. I, I just think, what will Christ think, you know? 
he wanders around for his entire life, bringing in people who nobody else will touch and nobody else wants to know, then as soon as he goes, we'll start rewriting it. All those people have been suffering for all those years, haven't they? We are still learning that, that faith, you know, or elements of faith can be a cancer that will disrupt that what's happening in society. And we can't really let that happen. And that brings faith into a, a, a contradiction with, with secular society. So my being an out and proud parent has affected others in, in my community. I mean, the most obvious case is my immediate family, because previously I wouldn't have discussed issues of faith with people quite as openly as I have. But now I have been challenged by people who support what I'm doing, but also by people who don't support what I'm doing. I think the role of accepting parents in the community is to normalize the emergence of LGBTQ people into the community without them having to go through the war that we've been through. If accepting parents can get out into the world and talk to the people around them, not just family, but friends as well, and normalize what should be a very, very simple transition into adulthood for people, then perhaps we can get away from the hangover of these irrational fears and phobias that people have got. And certainly in my own case, speaking to people around me, people didn't have that awareness and they didn't have it, not because of any prejudice, but simply because they'd not come across people to whom it had happened. Uh, I needed a grounding to realize that Christians are not all homophobic, but it is only a certain particular branch of Christianity that has that built in. And so the more people that can get out there and talk about their own personal experiences, the more ready the big wide world will be to, to accept people and to understand it's just a part of life. Religion uh, and culture do play a part in these negative attitudes for absolutely sure. Um, the religion gives you a bedrock on which to discriminate if you want to do so. I'm talking about the Christian religion now, which I know most about. But then the culture actually cherry picks and decides to do that. And, and presumably it did that for its own ends because the culture wishes to create and reproduce itself and, and make many more units for society that will learn the values of society and, and make money for society. So yes, religion has a vested interest in a state and it's not very many times that you see a religion standing against a state. We, we knew Derek for a long time because my, my best friend, he went out with him for a while uh, and they split up, but we kept in touch with him. But he, he grew up in a mining village. He had a, a crap life all the way through. He was rejected by his dad, he was rejected by his mom. He came to Nottingham, he got into a relationship with an abusive man. Um, the times that he, he had with my friend were probably a couple of years of deceased, but um, he'd had HIV for, for a long time and eventually got to the stage where he needed to take the tablets. And he didn't do it. He took them for a while, but I think he's just fed up. I think he just said, I, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm fed up with it, fed up with the fighting, you know, and it, <sighs> You know, to go, to go round, and we had to, we had to clear his stuff out. He was in a nursing home, and then he went in the hospital. Nobody w would take control of his stuff. Nobody would do it. They just weren't interested. So we went into the nursing home. They just kept ringing us up, saying, "Come on, come get his stuff. It's just piled up in through." It, it was. There were only a few people at the funeral. I, it's just horrible, I and mean, it's a life blighted.
what I would like to say to an, any LGBTQ individual who, who is, is struggling is just find a place to go where you will be accepted. There are places out there and go and get the help that you need to be accepted on a practical level on a personal level i would say you are fantastic don't let anybody undermine you your journey is amazing the race that you are running is incredible because you got to the winning post to be high besides you know, along with everybody else, despite the fact that you've had to start further back than them, that you have to fight for acceptance, that you have to fight for things which other people in society take for granted, which other people in society accept as a matter of right. Um, things are changing. It's going to take time. But we, I don't know who we are, but we love you for what you are and we don't want you to change we want you to be the person that you are because you are what you are and what you are is always always good enough the message i would like to give to hazel when she watches this and, and all the rest of the time is what you're doing is fantastic what you are is fantastic you know nothing you have done could ever surprise me other than the, the sheer joy of seeing what you're going to do next. You should never ever doubt yourself because, you know, we've set you up to succeed and you've succeeded. You should just go out there and be who you are because who you are is, has always been great and it's a privilege to walk beside you for 36 years and see who you've become. And I know you've got so much to give the world. And now with the fulfillment of, of a gay relationship, you're going to get even better. There's going to be even more love to go around. And I, I really look forward to the future and seeing what the future will hold. I think that will be, you know, just amazing for you.